So the first thing that we're going to do is we're going to go back and we're going to look at a work of social criticism by Jacob Lawrence. So let me find that in just a moment. And I'm going to remind you that we have actually, over this last couple of units, looked at a number of works in which artists have been engaging in social criticism. I'll remind you, for example, that, um, that William Hogarth, with all of his series, used satire as social criticism. But then in addition to that, when we get into the 19th century, um, Manet, with his Olympia, is, um, is critiquing society's hypocrisy by, um, since they don't admit to the existence of prostitution, for example. Um, um, Courbet is using social criticism um, in his work, The Stonebreakers, by calling out the mistreatment of the poor. Um, when we get to the 20th century, Rivetta is doing social criticism by calling attention to the social injustice suffered by the indigenous poor throughout all of Mexican history. And so um, when, as we come into the 20th century, we're gonna see more and more and more artists who are gonna use, um, who are gonna use their art as a platform for, um, for publicizing their own ideals and especially publicizing their, their, their unhappiness and their frustration with social injustice. One of those painters was named Jacob Lawrence, and we are looking at his work right here. Now, I love to compare Jacob Lawrence with William Hogarth, and the reason for that is that both Hogarth, who was 200 years earlier than this, both Hogarth and Jacob Lawrence used, created big, long series of paintings in which what they did was tell a long story. Remember that what Hogarth did with his marriage a la mode is that he would have a, a panel on the wall that had the text telling the story and then a painting illustrating that story. And then you would move to the next section in the story until you got all the way through. Jacob Lawrence is gonna do exactly the same thing by imagining a story from the very, very beginning, writing it all out in text, then what he's going to do is he is going to break that story into a bunch of different sections and then imagine an illustration for each of those sections. So the scene, the thing that, um, that Lawrence is most famous for is, um, is doing these series, which are especially about African American history. So um, another thing that I want us to remember as we talk about 20th century art and on up into contemporary 21st century art is that in addition to art that addresses social injustice, we're going to also see that many, many artists are using their art to explore their own identity. So in other words, what they're doing is they're asking, what does it mean to be, what does it mean to be African-American or what does it mean to be Chinese or, or what does it mean to be, to be of this ethnicity or of this religion or what does it mean to be, um, to be male? What does it mean to be, to, be, to be gay? What does it mean to be transgender? And so all of these artists who have, who have these identities are gonna use their art to explore what it means to experience life within that identity. And so the works that we see by Jacob Lawrence are going to do both of those things. They're going to address social injustice, and they are going to explore the experience of being within the identity of African-American. I think that having a bit of background on Jacob Lawrence is going to, is going to add meaning to this. So Lawrence was, um, was a very bright, smart young boy growing up in, in uh, Harlem in northern Manhattan in New York City during the 1920s and 1930s, during the period that was known as the Harlem Renaissance. And I'm just curious, can I just see, have you guys discussed the Harlem Renaissance in any of your other classes? Have you ever heard the phrase Harlem Renaissance? A few of you have, a few of you have not. So in a nutshell, what the Harlem Renaissance was, was a flowering in the neighborhood of Harlem, which was a, an African-American neighborhood in New York City. This artistic renaissance, this artistic flowering where, and it involved music and it involved literature and it involved art and just this creative explosion during the 1920s and 1930s. This is where we saw the birth of jazz, which was created by African-American musicians. And so we have great um, African-American poets, James Weldon Johnson, who wrote the, who wrote the um, Lift Every Voice and Sing that we sometimes sing in chapel was working then. And, and so Jacob Lawrence grew up during this time of incredible confidence and creative energy in, um, in Harlem. And as a child, he loved going to the Harlem Public Library. And the Harlem Public Library would put on display works of art by artists from right there in the Harlem Renaissance. And, and Lawrence loved these works. But then he felt a great sense of frustration because when he would go to the art history shelves, the art history shelves of the library, he couldn't find any African-American artists within the art history books. He couldn't even find any African art within those art history books because the racism was so pervasive at the time that African art was considered so primitive that it wouldn't have been included in art history textbooks. 
So as Lawrence grows older, he is going to take that frustration at feeling like the voices of African Americans were never recorded, were never heard, that the history of African American people was simply ignored and left out, that he is going to make it his role as an artist to be the historian of the African American community. And so what we're going to see in his career is that he is going to create many different series, very, very similar to what William Hogarth did um, back in the 18th century in England. And each of these series is going to be about some aspect of either African-American history or um, the history of African descendants in some other place. So, for example, one of his great series is about Harriet Tubman and the Underground Railroad. And there's another series that he did that is about the, um, the revolution among the slaves in Haiti. And so um, in all of these, what he does, again, is create a long narrative in text, divide up that text into sections, which will be placed on the wall. And then he creates illustrations for each of those sections of text. So the series that we are looking at is his most famous series that is called The Great Migration. And this series has 60 different paintings. And I'll explain how he did that process in just a moment. But first of all, the historical context for this, in the period just after World War I, when industrialization has absolutely swept through the cities of the northern United States, um, there was an interesting thing going on because those factories, the, the, the steel mills and the, and the automobile factories and, and the, the, uh, the, the cattle yards and, the, and, and so forth in the northern cities are desperate for workers. There is a worker shortage in these northern cities. At the same time, life for African Americans in the South in the years just after World War II was absolutely horrifying, as I'm sure you um, understand. Um, African Americans in the South were mainly working on farms. It was little better than indentured servitude. They were tenant farmers, always in a situation of owing money to the people who owned their land. This is at the same time that the Jim Crow laws are being instituted and um, just the horrendous situation where the Ku Klux Klan is growing, is, is loud and proud in their racism and their violence. There are um, lynchings, are an everyday thing, murders, cross burnings. The, um, the result being that there was an atmosphere for Blacks in the South. There was an atmosphere of palpable terror. And so what happened in these years after World War I, so I think 1920s and on into the 1930s, but mainly the 1920s, is that these northern cities would send recruiters down to the south where they would go into the African-American communities and they would try to get them to move to the north and take jobs in these, in these, um, in these slaughterhouses and steel mills and, and factories and so forth. And they promised um, economic, economic advancement. They promised also, and this is important, they, they painted the north as this place where the African-Americans would be able to escape from the violence and racism of the South. And so the result of this recruiting effort is that hundreds of thousands of Southern African-Americans got on the trains and took all of their worldly belongings and dispersed across these cities in the North. They went, and so we can see in this painting, this is the very first painting in this series where Lawrence is telling this story. We can see that this would be like a train station and here's the platform to go to Chicago and here's for New York and here's for St. Louis and over there would be Detroit and over there would be Pittsburgh. And so they're dispersing throughout the North. Well, um, the result of this is that the economic situation for many, many, many of these African Americans substantially improved. But the promises that if they had these ideas that they were going to be escaping from the racism of the South into this idyllic, peaceful place where they would be treated as equals, then they were bitterly, bitterly disappointed. Because even though the KKK was not, was not active, nearly as active in the North, and even though there was not the violence and the cross burnings and the lynchings and the murders nearly as often, what there was was the tremendous amount of um, more subtle sort of racism. Now, when I say subtle, I want to make sure that we understand the kind of racism that was being expressed that I'm calling subtle was subtle compared to lynchings. We would not think of it as subtle at all in our world today. The racism in the North, the racism in the North was less about violence, however, and more about white Americans feeling a sense of feeling a sense of superiority, feeling uh, looking down on African Americans as being inferior. And so, the way that this was expressed was through um, institutionalized segregation. So schools were segregated, neighborhoods were segregated, um, lunch counters were segregated, restaurants were segregated, theaters. The, the white people would sit on the on the on the floor level, and then the black people would have to sit in the balcony, kind of thing. So um, even though the 
violence is not as intense. The hurtful and damaging consequences of being treated as a lesser human being and without human dignity uh, continue, of course, to have devastating effects. And so the work that is in our image set, I think, is enormously powerful. But before we talk about this one, let's go back to this first one that is in the image set. And I'd like you to take just a second to talk about how you think that this work by Picasso of uh, synthetic cubism, how is it clear that Jacob Lawrence was influenced by synthetic cubism? Talk about that for a minute in the chat. All right, I really, really like this. I'm, um, I'm seeing things like the block, the color, the, 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 the solid unmodulating color overlapping completely two-dimensional, more geometric kinds of shapes, no detailed faces of any kind like that. That's absolutely true. Now, what I wanna do is I want us to compare what Jacob Lawrence's style is like to the style of narrative illustration that we saw in those medieval manuscripts where we talked about how when the illustrator, that monk that painted uh, Jacob wrestling with the angel, for example, or those people who did the Bayeux tapestry, what they did was used what we call visual economy, visual economy in order to tell the story. In other words, they eliminated every single unnecessary detail that they could and included only those things that are critical and central to telling the story. And so there is that simplification, there is that two-dimensionality, there's the solid blocks of color. It looks almost like cut-out construction paper, doesn't it? So as we move to, let's, let's talk about then what the process would be when he would create these series of like 60 images. As I said, he would write the story, he'd divide it into sections, he would, he would, he would then make sketches of what each of those 60 paintings is going to look like. And then he actually puts the, he puts, this is a tempera on a wood panel, I think is what it is. I'm sorry, I don't have that in front of me. But he would actually put those 60 wood panels all the way up through his studio. And then when he would do a particular color, for example, if he was going to do sort of this dark turquoise that we are looking at in this figure in the lower right, I know you can't see my pointer, but this figure in the lower right or this figure of the man holding the newspaper, what he would do is he would paint every single of the 60 paintings. He would put that color wherever he, he intended to have it in all 60 paintings in order to have a sense of visual unity among the 60 works. Wow, that's amazing, isn't it? So 60 paintings would all be in process at the same time. So I want to look at the specifics of this work right here because I just think this is an amazing work. Okay, it's tempera paint on hardboard is what that is called. So the main thing that I want us to think about is why did Jacob Lawrence, the artist, make the decisions that he made? Now remember that one of the skills that you are learning in this course and that you're going to show on the AP exam is your understanding of how the decisions an artist makes have an impact on us as the viewers. So I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and if we were in class together, you'd be doing this in pairs, but I'm just going to ask you to think about these questions and then we'll talk about them. So the first question that I want you to think about is, what is the vantage point of the viewer here? Where are we in relation to the scene? And why would Jacob Lawrence make that choice? So where are we, guys? Somebody call out for me. Y'all unmute yourselves, because I need you to really be able to call out pretty quickly. The bank? Well, we're in, we're in a restaurant is where we are. But what I'm asking is, what is our vantage point? Where are we in relation to the people? Kind of an aerial view? Yes, we're above them, aren't we? We, we're, we? we have this kind of bird's eye view where we're floating up above and looking down on them. Now, what I want us to think about is why he would have made that decision. Well, okay, so if we were down on, standing on this gray floor within this restaurant, we would not be able to see this golden rope that divides the space in two nearly as clearly. We wouldn't be able to see all of the people because if we were down on the same level as them, they would be blocking one another because of overlapping. We wouldn't be able to, we wouldn't be able to make out the people's facial expressions and so forth. We wouldn't be able to see what's on top of the tables nearly as well if we were down on the vantage point below. And so what he is doing Doing is he is using this scene within a restaurant to call out the social injustice in which segregation causes white people to receive better treatment than black people. Okay, so that is one of the decisions that he makes. 
Another thing that I want you to think about is what decision did he make about the way that he actually depicts the faces of the white people versus the black people? Think about that for a minute, look carefully. What do you notice, Madeline? The white people actually have like really distinct facial features. And then, and maybe it's just on my screen, but I can't see any, any on the others, other people. It's because there aren't any facial features on the other people. Now, why would he have chosen to do that? Remember that what he is doing is portraying the experience of being an African-American man in living in this identity. And so by showing the white people with facial features, what he is pointing out is that from the point of view of someone who is black, they're shown without facial features because it is as if the white people do not see them as individual human beings. They just see the color of their skin and they see nothing beyond that. That you're treated stereotypically as all being this or all being that characteristic. And so they are not given the dignity of individual human beings. Wow, that's powerful, isn't it? Another of the decisions that he made has to do with the poses. So let's look at the poses of the people on the left versus the people on the white, on the on the white, on the right. This guy up here sits up tall, his head is up in an almost assertive kind of look as if he is in command of the room, right? This guy down here has a scowl on his face as he buries himself in the newspaper. Um, very, very different sorts of very, very different sorts of poses from the kinds of poses that we see over here where this woman is hunched over the table. This guy up here hunched over the table as if he is simply exhausted, as if he is worn out from the experience of trying to make it under these kinds of social conditions. Another decision that Jacob Lawrence makes has to do with what is on the tables. So how would you differentiate what we see on this side versus what we see on this side? Think about that and I'm going to call call on somebody again in a sec. So Cam, how do you see how do you see what's on the on the tables as different on the two sides? Um, on the side with the white guys, there's it just like specifically in the front one, like he's not even eating, and there's already like a cup and like I assume either like a table, like I don't like that's either a menu or like some kind of place mat. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like silverware, whereas like on the other side, there's only like the necessities of what they're doing. So if they're not, right. there's not anything in front of them. Yeah, and what do you notice about the silverware here versus whoops, sorry, versus the silverware over here? Um, the silverware is gold on that side, or like yes, gold. right. And so what this suggests is that the people that are on the left side, I realize you can't see my pointer, the people on the left side are being treated differently from the people on the right. It is like this guy has been sitting here waiting and waiting and waiting, whereas these people on the left have already been served. The guy at the top looks alert and he's got already been brought a glass of water. This guy down here, he's already been brought, he's been brought a menu and water and a place setting and things like this, whereas these folks over here are not getting the same quality of service. Wow. All right, so with this series, he also makes a really interesting choice by using what looks like this gold velvet rope. It goes back and forth, and I want you to notice the rhythm with which he takes our eye from one side to the other side, uses the same colors to visually lead us from one part of it to another part of it, like that turquoise at the top, and then over here on, on, on the left on the guy's front, and then the color of the glass in front of the woman in the red. And so um, the velvet rope, now guys, we think of velvet ropes as dividers that keep the, the, the regular people away from the important people. Like think of the Oscars or something like that, where all of the regular people are kept, kept behind the golden velvet rope. What this seems to suggest to me is that what Lawrence is pointing out is that while things for African-Americans may not be as bad in terms of violence as they are in the South, the damage of the mistreatment due to the assumption of superiority on the part of the whites over the blacks and the um, refusal to associate is just as damaging. One final decision that I want you to pay attention to is even the positions of the figures the tables and the chairs are placed in such a way that the two sides do not interact. Um, this one has his back, they have their backs to one another. No one moves across this invisible side to communicate or even acknowledge the existence of the other side. All right, well, guys, I didn't get as much done as I needed to. And so I think that what I'm gonna be doing is doing some more teaching and then asking you to watch the videos of these other two works that I needed to get done today. So watch for that over the weekend and um, I'll, I'll, I'll try to have those done for you tomorrow if I possibly can, okay? Thank you again so much for coming, my darlings. Stay warm. I don't know what our situation, oh, I don't see you again until next Thursday. Can you believe that? Um, do start 
um, do start studying because our exam is going to be the Monday after that. Okay, we've only got one more class day, I think, one more class day until our exam over the weekend. All right, my darling, so stay warm, get some sleep, get caught up on your work, have a nice long break. Remember, I love you, and don't do anything I wouldn't do. Unmute, unmute, unmute. And I think your answer is. Yes, okay, my darlings, I will see you next Thursday. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thank you.